So this is going to definitely do more than I thought. Oh my. Hello, I'm Rob. Welcome to Tabletop in 10 Minutes, where you get to find out what happens on the top tables at the top tournaments in 10 minutes. The game we're about to look at was filmed at Summer Slaughter, a big Age of Sigmar event that happened in Pennsylvania in the United States of Yeehaw. The game was recorded while we were also live streaming the event, which you can go and watch back on our Twitch. And this is the first time I've turned one of these games into a battle report. There's a timestamp at the bottom so you can skip straight to the game. The first time I've put this together, I hope you like the format and I hope you enjoy the game. The key units in this fight will be for the Seraphon, the Slan, the two units of Salamanders and the big block of 30 Skinks. For the Iron Jaws, it's going to be the Maw Crusher and those two big units of six Gore Grunters. An Endless Spell will also feature in this game. An Endless Spell is cast by a wizard and is a representation of magic on the board. The Purple Sun has two main abilities. Number one, it reduces the saves of units in six inches. If it goes near a unit and you roll a one, that unit dies. Be ye god or, well, not actually Gargans, but most other things. We've got two armies, the Mighty Iron Jaws and the Magical Seraphon. Iron Jaws are the fightiest orcs in the mortal realms, covered in pig iron and grown bigger with each battle they fight. They are first and foremost a combat army that rushes into battle. This is represented in the game in a few ways. The smashing and bashing battle trait, which allows them to chain activate combats one after the other, and mighty destroyers, the command ability that lets them double move or charge when normally they can't. This particular clan of Iron Jaws was from the Bloodtooth clan, who paint their armor red and love riding gore grunters, creating heavy cavalry. These bacon torpedoes in game can move once they've wiped a unit out, an exclusive Bloodtooth's ability. The Seraphon are a little trickier to understand, but think of celestial dinosaurs with powerful magic and an arsenal of units and abilities to bring vengeance to the enemy. In the lore, a powerful battle toad of magic called a Slan is at the pyramid of the social structure and on the table the same is true. These Seraphon belong to the constellation known as the Fangs of Sotek, meaning they are more magical guerrilla fighters using hit and run tactics. They have access to summoning, teleporting and the ability to make skinks shoot and run away if you charge them. The battle plan is the Prize of Galette. This battle plan has five objectives but none of them are active until the first turn. Whoever goes second will get to activate one starting with the three in the middle. Don't forget you score a point for holding one objective, another point for holding two, and another if you have more. So it's a tough mission to get these points on. Welcome to the strategy room. No, not that. Welcome to the strategy room. It would seem going second is good because you get to pick the objective. This gives you good control of where your opponent is going to go in the first turn either leaving them overextended or in range of your units. You are also set up for the double turn, which does mean your opponent is going to be able to score on the first turn and zone out the board. This is going to give them a dominant board state and give them the opportunity to score heavily first. My advice is if your opponent can't do big damage on the first turn, then you should give them the first turn and set up in a way that you can strike at the active objective which you know you're going to choose before you even deploy. And that's the strategy. <laughs> Let's take a look at our players. Noah is from Vermont, but is originally a Florida man. Imagine a raging crocodile hunter on a speeding motorboat, reading Noam Chomsky and laughing at the sky. Last year, Noah was the 11th best performing player in the world, 7th in North America, and with the army we'll see him playing today, Iron Jaws was the second best performing player we have seen. Ridge is a steely-eyed master of mayhem from Canada, and this tall drink of water is a sweetheart on and off the table. Was the 5th best performing player in the world, 2nd in North America, and second with his faction, Seraphon. Players with such a high skill cap are going to produce an incredible game, and this is a doozy. Going into the game, you can see both players have deployed their key units defensively, but with the ability to strike where they need. Now you know what the armies do, and you've met the players. It's time for tabletop in 10 minutes. Noah has placed his three units of three Gore Grunters in a defensive screen to protect his larger units from first turn charges. His two units of six Gore Grunters are here. They are in the Bounty Hunter Battalion, which means they are getting plus one damage against Ridge's Skinks. That you can see Ridge is protecting at the back of the board. Gore Grunters are amazing for a couple of reasons. They are fast, and with the Maw Crusher's ability, the Skull Shaking Bellow, to move up to three units in the Hero Phase, they have an effective 18-inch move, taking them to about here. Ridge has set up 10 skinks as a screen and has put one salamander as bait in terrain on the far left hand side. Salamanders have an amazing shooting attack called Stream of Fire, which we will see later on. If they are charged, they will deplete the unit that charges them and they're also gaining plus one save 
due to being in cover. The Gorgrunters, though, want to fight that unit of 30 skinks at the back, but this is where it gets really interesting. The Orcs have a mad musician called a War Chanter. He adds plus one to the damage of melee weapons. Belonging to a unit, and Gorgrunters have two weapon profiles, so it's twice as effective. In addition, being bounty hunters, they also get plus one damage against galley vets. So they are damage three on each melee weapon. Pig power! This would make any skink run away, which is perfect because Ridge is playing Fangs of Sotek. This means if the bacon bashers charge into those 30 skinks, they can stand and shoot and then on a four plus run away. Meaning we will have some disappointment for the Iron Jaws. Those skinks also have some great damage potential. They will have 60 blowpipe shots, and if the skink priest has blessed them with its staff, they get to do mortal wounds in addition, making them a formidable unit, all for 225 points. The Maw Crusher is placed at the back of the board to protect it from the salamanders that can be teleported and then shoot. If they make the charge, will fight and most likely kill it. The Maw Crusher is the key piece to the Iron Jaws army and it has two roles. It's wicked fast due to its mighty destroyers and the mount trait Fasten. This means it has the movement threat range of 36 inches and it's a damage dealer in its own right. It also uses Skull Shaking Bellow, meaning you can move three units, give all out attack three times, or even redeploy three times. And so good use of the Maw Crusher separates the good from the bad players, and keeping it alive is really important. The last key unit we see before the game unfolds is the Mighty Slan. It generates summoning points and can do mortal chip damage anywhere on the board. But for this game, its ability to cast endless spells is key. With the command trait, Arcane Might, which allows you to reroll casts and getting plus three to cast, is very likely to be able to cast those spells. Noah gave Ridge the first turn and chose the center left objective to be active. Ridge starts out by buffing up the skinks in case they are charged and then casts the purple sun at Noah's army. Ridge moved three units of skinks onto objectives and then summoned a fourth unit of skinks to create a second screen. If he gets double turned, his castle is safe. The bait salamander came off his rock and moved onto the left objective. He then teleported two salamanders to the right hand flank and objective and did five damage to one of the units of three Gorgrunters, killing one. Ridge has tagged two units with his skinks, so the mighty destroyer's ability means they have to attempt to charge in the hero phase. In Noah's first turn, he elects to attempt to charge with one of the units and fails and moves the Maw Crusher up using Mighty Destroyers, uses the command trait to cause three mortal wounds to the Salamanders, giving him plus three to cast, but the Slan stops. Basham lads, a spell for plus one to wound. He then uses his once per game Fasten to go back to where he started. The Purple Sun moves and kills a Gorgrunter from the unit of six. A unit of three and six pigs move onto the left objective and the Maw Crusher moves out of range of the Purple Sun. The unit of three Gorgrunters on the right charge and the Salamanders stand and shoot and do 12 damage killing two gore grunters. Wow, that was a that huge was, that spike. That was spicy. That there, was Ridge. a spicy roll. No, no, that was a really a spicy bit of a roll. tamale situation. Holy fuck. The two gore grunters in the center charge the back screen of skinks and the five gore grunters charge the front screen. The solo salamander on the left is killed from mortal wound impact hits. This is a great chance to show you smash them and bash them. Every time a unit is outright killed by an Iron Jaws unit, they can then activate another Iron Jaws unit in combat. After killing the center bottom skinks, Gore Grunters did two damage to the Salamanders on the right. The Salamanders kill the remaining Gore Grunter that's charged them, and all the skinks at the top die, apart from one, Simon the Skink. Because the Iron Jaws are from the sub-faction Bloodtooths, the six Gore Grunters on the left move after they've wiped out a unit, capping the bottom objective. The three on the left attempt to charge into the two salamanders, avoiding the stand and shoot, and the two at the top pile in and tag the 30 skinks. Ridge uses a command point to keep Simon the Skink alive and not running away from Battleshock. Let's have a quick turn recap. Ridge gave Noah a lot of options to charge, but didn't really lose a lot of valuable resources when he did so. In fact, winning the trade between the charging Gore Grunters and the Salamanders. However, the Blood Tooth's ability meant Noah's army was able to tag a lot of units, putting Ridge in a tough spot on where to apply resources in the following turn. So at the end of turn one, going into priority, this is how the board looks. Pause the video now and write in the comments on who you think is going to win and see if you're as good as a commentator as me. With the scores tied, priority roll, both rolled a one and Ridge took the turn and Noah made the bottom objective active. Ridge cast some spells that did some chip damage onto the war chanters at the back. He kills a gore grunter in the unit of two, tagging the 30 skinks. The purple sun then kills a war chanter.
Boo! Boo! Purple sun! Boo! Boo. Ridge doesn't want to move the salamanders on the left because Noah will redeploy his unit of Gorgrunters. The skinks from the right teleport to the left hand side, again shutting down the move ability from mighty destroyers and gaining the right objective due to them being expert conquerors, therefore counting as more on the objective. The salamanders on the left kill Gorgrunters in shooting. The 30 skinks kill the last Gorgrunter in the center. The salamanders on the right then go crazy. So I'm going to shoot the sallies at him. 673. Fuck, so this is gonna definitely do more than I thought. Oh my fucking shit, Noah. Uh, six. Three, six, nine, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 damage. And kill three more gold grunters in shooting. They then charge, needing a 10, and kill another one, leaving one remaining. Moving into Iron Jaws turn two, sees Noah move his remaining unit of six Gore Grunters into the middle and the Moor Crusher near the Skinks on the left. This is a huge moment for the game because Ridge saved Simon the Skink from running away from Battleshock in turn two. Noah was able to charge him and then stay three inches away from the 30 Skinks, meaning they couldn't use parting shot and run away. We thought Simon was a hero, but it turns out he was the hapless fool delivering porcine death to his friends. That single? Fucking skink. This is great for Noah, otherwise he would have had to face 60 shots doing more tools into his depleted army. In another act of heroism, the war chanter at the bottom charges into the killer salamanders and wipes them out in combat. By the way, that was fucking incredible. The war chanter, yeah. <laughs> Two attacks Left through. on one wound and he fucking just... <laughs> oh, <laughs> The Moor Crusher rolls an 11 for its charge and charges the Salamanders on the top left. The Moor Crusher only kills the Skink Handlers and some Saurus Guard, but the Gore Grunters do 42 damage to the 30 Skinks, wiping them off the board. The score is Seraphon 7, Iron Jaws 9. Iron Jaws win priority to turn 3. The big unit of Gore Grunters in the center charge the Slan and the Star Priests. The Moor Crusher stomps off the last salamander at the top and kills the remaining Saurus guard. The Gorgrunters kill some skink priests, but not the slan, and one Gorgrunter runs away from Battleshock. In Seraphon turn three, Ridge retreats the slan from combat at the top, and then Noah redeploys the Gorgrunters and the Moorcrusher. Ridge then summons 10 skinks onto the right-hand objective and teleports his 10 skinks to the bottom objective and scores five points to wrap up turn three. Noah wins the priority into turn four and Ridge makes the center objective active. Although the board looks good for Noah, he struggles to find a battle tactic this turn and is in danger due to the sun being close. He decides to kill that damned slan with his general, which is the Moor Crusher, and just risk the purple sun. And... Ah, boo! Escapes. The Gorgrunters move, charge, and kill the Ashloth banner bearer at the top right. However, the Moor Crusher is unable to complete its charge due to the Realm Shaper engine and the purple sun being in the way, which means Noah fails the battle tactic, costing him two points. In Seraphon turn three, Ridge does some mortal wound damage to the Moor Crusher, and then... End of the hero phase, sun moves. Uh, actually don't care, so I'll just leave it there, and let's just see if this monster goes down Mom again. Crusher, and then sun. Oh no, is that Mod Crusher? Yeah. <laughs> Pick him up. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Noah! Right. Jesus Christ! Both his line. Does he? He takes it yeah, as well. Yeah, everything. Oh, okay. I didn't know it was both. Oh, oh my yeah, God! Yeah. I was gonna say that gets my whole plan gone. Ridge teleports the slan onto the left-hand side objective, summons ten more skinks, and that's the game. Through turn five, the Seraphon would have got the points needed with the grand strategy to secure the victory. That was a pretty exciting match. Big spike damage from Ridge there, especially with those salamanders. Ridge eventually finished 22nd at Summer Slaughter, and he was using Seraphon, who currently have a 54% win rate. I personally think there's quite a few builds in the Seraphon book, but they all focus around some of those key units, specifically salamanders, skinks, bastilodons, and either slans or the croak. Noah went on to finish 29th, and I think he got Purple Sun again in one of the later rounds, which is pretty tough. The 50% win rate, I think Iron Jaws are in a pretty good place in this edition. I think Gorgrunter builds will continue to be excellent because they're fast, they're mobile, and they have amazing output. The event was actually won by Anthony Trentinelli, who uses Heathen Knights of Sanesh. We recorded several of those games, and they might become tabletop in 10-minute videos. I think we learned quite a lot from this singular match. We understood the mobility and power of the Iron Jaws. We also understood their weakness to magic. At the time of recording, Magical supremacy is incredibly important, as is magical defense. 
And a lot of these changes occurred because we saw all the endless spells get updated a few months ago. I actually did a tier show looking at all the endless spells and you can click the link above or find it in the show notes. We also learned that even though Salamanders have effectively doubled in points since their release, they're still incredible. I think Ridge didn't need to necessarily zone out the board as much as he did in the first turn. This gave Noah some great opportunity to get some charges, especially into his backfield. However, Noah had the mobility to always strike at the backfield, so maybe Ridge's plan was to always make it so that he was fighting where he wanted him to fight, so he could bring the Salamanders and the Purple Sun to bear on the key pieces in Noah's army. Noah also had the opportunity to use the monstrous action Smash to Rubble to destroy the Realm Gate, so that he could have eventually in the next turn attacked the Slam. So that's the first tabletop in 10 minutes battle report. Now, if you already follow me on the Honest Wargamer or on the T-Sports Network, you'll know that what I mainly tend to do is work towards live streaming big tournaments and events. This is the first time I've turned one of these into a battle report. Normally, I'll upload the entire file onto Patreon, and that's mainly because I've been working towards this day for quite a few years, actually. Getting the format right and putting it exactly how I want to put it together has been a pretty long process, and I've been really interested in trying to get something that I want to watch. I don't really have time for three hour battle reports and I also do not play these armies as well as these players. I think it's impossible really for anyone to play that many armies at that level. And so going to live events has always been my way of being able to see how the top players play the top armies at the time. And I've been able to get some good information from that. I think this is kind of the next step that I want to take in being able to produce that information for you at home. This is where you come in. What did you like and what didn't you like? What can I do to make these so that you want to support me on Patreon and make it so that I can make more in the future? When we attend events, we sometimes record up to 20 games. Now, I can't edit 20 of these in a week because sometimes I'll do an event and then another event in a week and it's just not possible to put all of those into this edited format. I would really like to do one a week going forward, but I would also like to do more, but that just requires more resources. So if you enjoyed what I'm doing and you want to help support the show, then you can like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, support me on Patreon, or any of those other things. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you leave some comments and talk to me about it, and we can start a kind of a big conversation about how we look at information from tournaments. Thanks very much for listening to Tabletop in 10 Minutes. I'll see you soon.